There's a turd in Saturday. You can't go there. <laughs> hey, all you cool cats and kittens. Welcome to Midnight Chats and episode 92. Here with James Acaster as tonight's guest. This is an episode that I recorded a few weeks ago, actually. Actually, maybe more than that, because it was before quarantine. It was before the lockdown and coronavirus had really taken a hold. So, uh, it, yeah, it, it was of a, a freer time when I met James and we originally we met up to discuss a new podcast it would have launched by now it's been a little bit delayed but it is coming now on the 24th of April James Acaster's Perfect Sounds it is a podcast version of his book that you might be aware of which was called Perfect Sound Whatever and that was a book of his favourite albums from the year 2016 there's a whole story about Wire 2016, which we get into a little bit in this podcast. To fill you in on that, James had a really terrible 2017, which happened from the very beginning of the year, when in January he was dumped by his girlfriend. So to get over this heartbreak, and there were some other things going on in his uh, career, I believe, he went and listened to all the new music that he could find on those end of year lists that were still floating around from 2016 and he became completely obsessed by the music on these lists he has bought now to date at this point in time he has bought over 600 albums from the year 2016 and um, he's written the book about it and now he's making this podcast about it which as I say starts on the 24th of April on the BBC Sounds app I'm sure you know loads of James's work he's got an incredible Netflix special if you've not seen that I'd really recommend it Um, it's like a three-parter it's incredible it's very clever very smart stand-up comedy and he has his own podcast as well as this new one which he hosts with Ed Gamble the comedian Ed Gamble which is where we start the conversation I've put a load of links in the description of this podcast because there's a hell of a lot of music that he talks about loads of stuff loads of obscure things and um, I've just included a few of those that's all you need to know thank you for downloading thank you for sticking with midnight chats during these strange times hopefully it's keeping you company Um, there's plenty there if you've not listened to all of them some of them are better than others that's for sure I feel like we've uh, we've got better as time goes on there'll be another one next week and um, then we'll see how it goes hopefully we'll get some more together soon but um, in the meantime if you do want to support us in any way the best way to do that is to just give a donation at loudandquiet.com forward slash subscribe it can be for any amount if that is if now is a bad time for that that's completely fine just ignore that enjoy this podcast but that is the way that you can support us if you would like to in the meantime this is james acaster on midnight chat number 92 you would have been told this fact today i'm sure but we're currently in the we're in the basement of a restaurant, but this used to be the live lounge. Yes. For Radio yes. 1. Yes, so it's, it's pretty mad to think about it, actually. But yeah, it's a restaurant now and it's called Caravan. And uh, downstairs, yeah, this was the live lounge and they sold it to Caravan. And then they still let us come in here and record if we want to. <laughs> so that's pretty good. We're here to talk about a new podcast, but your, your podcast you do with Ed. Yes. Off Menu. Mm-hmm. What's the setup like? That it, do you, I'm guessing you don't record that in the basement of Caravan. We don't go to the live lounge to do that. No, no, we we uh we just record it wherever we can. Sometimes wherever that is best for the guests, and um, the setting is always the same, which is the dream restaurant. So uh, wherever wherever we are, we just set it in the guests' dream setting for a meal. You've done like fifty odd of those now, right? Done a lot, yeah. A lot. Approaching fifty, yeah, definitely. It seems to be going very well. It's been really fun. I'm really glad that. Uh, I mean, yeah, you start off a podcast like that because it's a conversation that you have with your mate all the time. And so you're like, well, let's do a podcast about it now because we're always talking about what our favourite dishes are that we've ever had anywhere. So why don't we just do it? If we're having that conversation, may as well continue to have it and record it. Um, And you don't expect anyone else to listen to it. And it's really nice when they do. Everyone seems to get into it. Yeah. That you've had. From the ones I've listened to, everyone's like up for it. Have Mm. you had anyone who's like maybe not, not been as keen there's to go with it one episode that hasn't come out yet that is coming out i don't think in this series but maybe in the next series uh where uh 
I clash with the guest in a way that is unanticipated and so apparent and obvious that that's why I'm fine saying it because people will when you get to the episode you'll know which one it is and it's not that they don't go with the episode they're actually more than happy to talk about food but they're not happy to go with me right okay <laughs> who is, a is young... someone that you um... I've never met him before You've not met him before? No. Okay, it's not an old not, buddy. He, no, he did not like, he did not really get why I was pretending to be a genie and pretending to be a waiter. And uh, he did not understand what my sense of humour was. And so very much he buddied up with Ed on that. And uh, they were friends and I was, uh, my confidence evaporates uh, almost instantly and then even more so as the episode goes on. So it will be very obvious which one that is. Okay, and that's is that, that's coming up soon, is it? Mm-hmm. Excellent. Well, it's coming out in I think maybe the fourth series. Okay, we're on the third series as we speak now. I don't think it's in this series. I think it's going to be in the next. All right, we, we, we've recorded a lot in advance. I don't even want. I'm not even going to ask you who it is. I'm gonna. No, I think it's more fun. It's more fun to just yeah find it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and absolutely no. Yeah. Because it, it will it be apparent. Be, it's so obvious. <laughs> like, don't. If, if you're in the one and you're unsure, I think, oh, maybe it's that one. It's not that one. That <laughs> one was fine. And it's just you thinking that I had more of an awkward time than I did. But um, it's very obvious which one it is. There, there's that podcast, but you're mm. about to launch this new podcast, which is essentially why we're here. Yes. It's like the podcast version of your book, yeah. which was called Perth- Perfect Sounds Whatever. Yes. Podcast has dropped the whatever, isn't it? It's just Perfect Sounds. Is that right? Pop, yeah, so the, the book's called Perfect Sound Whatever and the podcast is called Perfect Sounds. James A. Cass is Perfect Sounds. Um, and it's all about me deciding that 2016 is the greatest year for music of all time. And I decide that because I've become obsessed with it. Because in 2017, I have a bad personal year and I deal with that by obsessively buying music from the previous year, 2016. And I now own over 600 albums that came out that year. And so I can't deny it's the greatest year for so music all time. Be. Well, I just found the the most amount of albums that I like. From you know, there's no other year in history where I have that many albums that I love. Yeah, and like you know, there's like all the albums I've bought, I like them. But then there's you know hundreds that I love within that and so you can't then go nah that's not that nah i'm gonna say that 1971 is because everyone else says that and so i don't want to look stupid so i'm gonna agree with everyone and say no yeah it's not in 71 because all those albums came out when really i don't listen to those albums the albums that i love and that i'm most obsessed with uh that all came out in one year are the 2016 ones so yeah. i think that the big message to all music fans i would say is stop worrying about other music fans thinking you're cool because those are not the people who really love music. They don't matter. Ignore those people. They're big on their message boards. They're having a great time on there. Meanwhile, none of them are connecting to anything proper and actually enjoying themselves and getting what you're meant to get out of music, which is a a strong personal connection to it. And there's the social connection as well to music, which is great being in a room full of people who all like the same band, watching that band live and singing along together feels like church. It's great. And I appreciate that as well. But the dream is the crossover of the two. You've listened to an album, you've connected with it, you've obsessed over it. You go and see that band. Everyone's like-minded and the same and you all sing along. Not academically, just going around the internet going, oh, what's the best year for music? Okay, yeah, it's that one actually. And saying that with each other. No, no, no. You gotta, you gotta, the, the best is subjective. I think I, I should I think say right. favorite, really. Okay, but I, uh, yeah, I um I think you're right. I think um, not enough people discover new stuff as well. Yeah. So so you you started listening to to just contextualize this that pe- for people that maybe haven't read the book yes. or don't know about this podcast, as you say, 2017 was a bad year. Yeah, just for me personally, and and. And it it was bad at the beginning, right? Because this is Straight where away. this is why this is why twenty sixteen happens because a lot of end of year lists were still around mm. for like the best of twenty sixteen, and they're still there now. And I'll tell still you that there. Much. they never get erased <laughs> off the internet. That's the beauty of a project like this. You'll always have the resources there. But yeah, they'd all gone up at the end of the end of twenty sixteen. And I, you know, in twenty sixteen, I'd started to pay attention to current music again for like over a decade. I Did hadn't you not? bothered. No, for, for about a decade. I'd mainly just, you know, got into... I was getting into new albums, but they were albums from 
way back when yeah. people were recommending me going oh yeah have you heard you know whatever this album from the 70s it's a really obscure weird album I'll buy those and get into that but I wrote off modern music I thought it's nothing good's getting made now and every now and again I'd you know buy something that was current but it'd have to be really heavily recommended to me and uh, in 2016 you know the year kicked off in January with David David Bowie dying Black Star coming out and suddenly everyone paid attention to that album and was like, oh my God, this album's amazing. He's talking about death and about being dead, but also musically, he really was pushing himself right to the end. It's a really avant-garde jazz rock album and it, and, uh, it, it wasn't like stuff he'd done in the past. So this is incredible. And like, so I remember like people talking about that. I think, okay, that sounds cool. But in my cynical brain, going like, <laughs> ah, it's just because he died. Yeah, that's not the only Still reason. no, it's not Ziggy Star. Uh, yeah, that's the only reason you guys are saying it. So I kind of ignored it. And then Lemonade came out later on in the year. And it wasn't just hardcore Beyonce fans who were loving that. It was like music snobs were going, no, actually, this is, fucking, this is a really properly good album. She's not just done a, a few singles. The whole album's great. And there's a visual album to go with it. And she's really thought about thematically the whole thing ties together. And like, you know, all my social media was awash with people going nuts for it. And I was like, oh, I haven't seen this happen in a while with like a really mainstream pop artist and everyone going crazy about an album they've done. And then Frank Ocean released Blonde in August. And, uh, and you know, I remember this. I, I was hearing that Nish Kumar, a friend of mine, a comedian, was playing it around the flat we were living in at the time. And um, I assumed, you know, that uh, it was playing Ivy, the second track on the album. And I just thought, what an amazing song. And surely this has just passed me by. It's probably a song from way back when, and I'm, you know, old and uh, I, I'm you know, out of touch and whatever. And I said to Nish, what's this? He said it was released today. It's by Frank Ocean. It's his new album. The album's amazing. And then seeing everyone evangelising about that album online, I was like, maybe I've been wrong about current music and I should engage with it a bit more. So I started to read those end of year lists when, you know, well, you know November onwards, they start kind of like slowly. Yeah, and in December, there's loads of them. And then in January 2017, where my relationship broke up, um, I instantly retreated to the most recent thing that had brought me comfort, which was listening to these albums, which is reading those lists, buying new music and listening to those albums. And so I continued to do that until I, um, you know, the plan was just like, just every time you feel sad, just do that. Pretty much all that year I felt sad. So every single night it was obsessively buying albums, six or seven albums a night sometimes. And, um, you know, finding the time to listen to, listen to them, going back to some more than others. And that kind of, you know, it's gradually got less and less as time has gone on. And the reason for doing it has become different. I'm not going on it every time I feel sad now. If I do do it, I'm doing it out of curiosity or because someone's recommended me something. But it just kind of continued even past 2017. So are you still doing it now? I found an album last night that I really like. So Did yeah. You? What yeah. was it? It was. I'm going to have to look at this on my phone because I don't know how to pronounce the name. Um, it's a really weird, like, uh, electronic... Um, kind of noisy electronic album with spoken word over the top of it uh it's by um mplex e double m p l e k z it's called rook to tn34 and it's this guy that's this, a good title yeah it's a good title and it's this weird electronic like um little soundscapes in the background it's like, <laughs> but like horrible grumpy noises and this guy over the top going there's a turd in saturday you can't go there. But un, uh, uh, what's it? unidentified item in the bagging area and saying stuff like that over the top of it. I was like, absolutely on board for this. I'm, I'm on board for this. Yeah. This sounds it's, it's great. Good. And it just also, a lot of the time, it becomes stuff where you go, if I'm buying this much music from one year and an album like that, I can't just ignore that. An album that is like that. Yeah. And there's a man talking like that over me. You can't go, well, uh, I'm, I'm meant to be a, uh, the, the, the foremost, you know, the the main number one scholar on 2016 music but i'll ignore the album where a guy saying there's no turd in saturday over the top of a weird electronic uh you know little horrible keyboard noise so yeah had to buy it i mean and what's your pol been your policy i feel i have to ask this post 2016 uh-huh any interest in 2017 oh, to now absolutely i've bought more music from 2017 2018 2019 than I have in any re year before 2016. Okay, how's it so, stacking up to oh, 2016? it's not as many. And no, but never... I mean, do I mean quality? Oh, quality-wise. Well, I guess it's all relative because, like, I bought less albums from each year. Yeah. So, you know, I've not... 
I've definitely not exceeded the 100 mark in any of those years since. Probably not even exceeded the 50 mark. But maybe I've been nudging 50 on each year that I've bought. But I'd say that each year I've ended up with between, you know, two or five albums that are going to stay with me for a very long time and some of them will become my favourites of all time. And, uh, yeah, 2016, there's like hundreds of those. But, like, um, I still think that's that's more than I was finding each year before. You know, before I did this project, at the end of every year, I wasn't like, I've got a new album that came out this year that is now going to stay with me for ages and become one of my favourite albums. That wasn't happening because I wasn't looking for anything. And now that I am engaged more, you know, in 2017... I found Hope by Shamir, uh, amazing album. It's one of my favourite albums ever. In 2018, I was listening to Everything's Fine by Gene Gray and Quelle Chris. That's one of my favourite albums ever, you know? And like uh, 2019, I'm trying to think about what the album was that I would have said was my favourite one of last year. Um, I mean, I know there was a lot. So it's really, this is really going to annoy me because I know I'm going <laughs> to come away from this and go, why didn't you just say that album, which is clearly your favourite? But uh, there was a lot last year. There, there was... Uh, uh, the, the clipping album that came out last year was like oh the one I, I really loved blood it. the blood one it was there existed a, there existed an addiction to blood yeah. and it was like a horrorcore rap album and uh, I, that really blew my mind yeah. um, and did you hear that record from 2016 I did I got I have Splendor and Misery from 2016 and their EP Riggle that came out in 2016 mm. so they released two projects and uh, yeah really like those uh, I'd say I love They Existed to Blood even more because I think it's like more focused but I love that they released a concept album in 2016 uh, set in the future about an astronaut who's a slave who escapes the slave ship and flees uh, across the vastness of space and falls in love with the ship that he hijacks uh, and they have a relationship together I think it's amazing that they released that album and uh, incorporated like spirituals and stuff into the album as well there's a lot of great hooks on it Davy Diggs is an amazing and rapper um so that was what got me into that band was so through that got into you know, a whole band and continued to follow their career which is again something i wasn't doing before doing this project i wasn't following bands careers as they happen yeah. and evolve i was you know going back and finding dead bands and finding what they were up to sure. now i can anticipate albums which is a great feeling what were you so what were you when you grew up what were you growing up listening to um way back well when i was in primary school so i got into music pretty early on through going to church and stuff i'm not religious anymore but i was raised in a christian family and um going to church there was a look it was like a rock band church one of those churches yeah uh hip, they're, they're like a hip cool church yeah like a hip cool yeah. church and people are kind of like you know pretty breezy christians yeah. um and i loved watching the band and the, the drummer especially and i started learning drums when i was seven um and I remember, like, first getting into music was, like, you know, uh, all the big, like, popular songs that everyone knows uh, and that are funny as well. Like, music had to be slightly funny. So, like, Down Under, that Down Under song by Men at Work. Yeah. I just found it hilarious. <laughs> and lo so I loved it. I loved rocking all over the world because the idea of rocking all over the world was mad. Like, <laughs> like there's this thing about what that would be. Um, Hi-Ho, Silver Lining, I loved it, you know, and songs like that. Um, obviously I loved In the Jungle The Mighty Jungle I'm Not Made of Stone uh, so like you know, stuff like that all the time and then like I kind of started in primary school I was loving just pop music I, I really loved uh, whatever was in the, the charts you know I, I was Aqua Dr. Jones uh, and Barbie Girl Who not many people would leave with Dr. Jones but that was my favourite <laughs> yeah. one of the two that's a deep cut yeah, out of the two isn't it well, for the real Aqua fans <laughs> uh, and then like heavily into Oasis for a while heavily, heavily into the Spice Girls for their first album and then heavily not into them immediately after that Yeah, but like you know still see that as a very what was at, your, at the school you went to what was the thing because I grew up in yeah. Essex and the thing that we we got really into Oasis was the yeah the whole school got into that. You had to like Oasis even if you didn't like Oasis. Yes. You know, um, what, what was, what was that? Were you in, t like, were you in step with your friends and the rest of the school? Not so much. Oasis wasn't, yeah, I, not many people liked Oasis and stuff in my school that I remember. Hmm. It was more East 17, Spice Girls, uh, all those kind of, Peter Andre for a while. Everyone oh, yeah. liked Peter Andre. And, uh, you know, all the boys had to aspire to have six packs and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> there was a tuck shop called Flavor in our school. Uh, spelt the way Peter Andre spells it, F-L-A-V-A. 
Um, so it's like all that kind of, you know, people were into that kind God, of God, they stuff. really liked, they really liked Andre. People loved Peter Andre for yeah. a while. It was like really big. Um, but like, yeah, outside of that, people weren't really into guitar bands as much. Okay, yeah. And things. So I was into Oasis a lot until the, I mean, I basically was into the first two Oasis albums. And then yeah. I bought Be Here Now on the day it came out, listened to it once, decided it's the best album I've ever heard. Listened to it a second time and was really disappointed. Yeah. And, uh, Didn't it come out the week that, princess diana died yes or something like that which i the, think i think the band might might blame for the reason it yeah i mean it still sold loads interesting loads reason to time. blame yeah because like <laughs> i i don't understand if it didn't sell much yeah that you would blame it on that <laughs> it makes no sense with the biggest band in the world and we made no money i guess because we have a car <laughs> crashed into a swimming pool in the front of our album people thought that was bad taste because princess diana's just died that'd be fair enough yeah. but you sold loads and people said it was shit and people said it so was that's bad. not yeah, yeah. That's not because of... Di- I thought that they were listening to it and there was a cloud hanging over us because of the death of Princess Diana. No. And then we couldn't enjoy... <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't enjoy, uh, you know, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so, like, it, it was it was more that... Uh, it was just wasn't as musically dense and rich and the melodies weren't as memorable as the first... Those first two albums, God, it's like... Everything about them is, you know, is great. There's the rawness of the first album... And the second album, which is the one that I connected to the most uh, at, at that age, has just got so many memorable songs and hooks on there, mm. and it's executed perfectly. And that third one, just not as much to it. You kind of get the, and it's all surface layer. Yeah. And then the next listen, you go, oh, there's nothing really more to it than the initial hook that was on there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, you know, that was it. <laughs> that was it, guys. It wasn't Die. It wasn't Business Diana. So when did you start, because you, you're a drummer, You've drummed in bands. Mm-hmm. When did you? What what type of st- what style of band was that? Like an Oasis? Was your first band like an Oasis E band? No, it's like by the time I was in bands, I liked like I was listening. I was reading Kerrang and stuff like that. I really liked um, metal and punk and grunge, especially. Um, and um, I wanted to be in those kind of bands. So like uh, I was. Like 13, 14, when I started playing in bands with the people in school, and they were all into the same stuff. So we were just covering Smells Like Teen Spirit, Bored by the Deftones, you know, songs like that, Walk by Pantera. And we were doing all those kind of songs. Um, by the time I started writing music in a band, we were doing like new metal for our sins. <laughs> and it was like all kind of, but we had two guitarists who were very good guitarists, one of which was like a, you know, like a child prodigy who should have gone somewhere, but uh, you know, no one ever really nurtured his talent when they should have. But this kid was like amazing. What's what's he doing? Do you know what he's doing now? No idea what Matthew Butler's doing now. I hope he's doing well. He, uh, I bet he's still an amazing guitarist. I bet shredding he in like the... he'll still be shredding probably in a, in a pub in a like a pub yeah. rock band, and everyone's like, "I'm sorry, who the fuck is that? <laughs> because why is he here? Like it was it was just so good." Um, and like it there's was, always one kid in the school that's like, was this kid yeah. at your school it's at my school yeah we just, had you know he won't mind me saying this bottom set for everything yeah and just an incredible guitarist and it, it's the failings of the teachers to not go okay he needs to do that for a living because otherwise he's not gonna you know, you know like <laughs> These other things aren't for him and that's fine you don't have to be good at maths you don't have to you know, like that doesn't have to be your life He's inc- he's better at the guitar than anyone else is at any subject in, in his year. So we need to nurture that, not just write off music and go, no, well, that's not a proper thing. It is a proper thing. People do it for a living. <laughs> yeah. So like you could easily make it his job and you're not bothering because at the end of the day, you're not actually very good at your jobs. <laughs> so awful stuff. Um, I, you know, I really hope he has found a way of making that work, but I haven't heard from him but right. uh, he so, was just like we're doing new metal songs and then suddenly there's this joe satriani style solo just midway through <laughs> and everyone would be like wow well, that's different and that was like you know what was your singer like we never settled on a singer okay right yeah we, we does had that this, mean you did you all take turns in that case or you just you, no we had different singers okay we had a couple of gigs with no singer uh, and about four gigs with different singers and uh the longest serving was, was this guy who just uh he would sing really nice in the band practices and then scream <laughs> on stage. And we were like, can you please just sing nicely like we've asked you to? And he was like, yeah, 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 I'll do it next time. And then he would scream again. Um, and what, 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 was that just a nerves thing? Like he'd get up I there? N- I guess it must have been a nerves thing. The adrenaline thing. maybe? It must have been a nerves thing that he was like, or that in the moment of doing the gig, it's what made sense to him. Was Because he would also like, he would always like, 
He'd always put a dress on as well. He, he had like a floral dress and he would put that on, which he hadn't run that by us either, but we didn't care as much because who cares? <laughs> but yeah. like, it was like, okay, that's cool. Like you're, you're doing a bit of a performance there and you've got a stage outfit, but then just screaming. And it's like, I love screaming as much as the next person in music as long as it suits the songs. But it really didn't. <laughs> it really didn't at all. So when did you, when was the last time you drummed? Have you, do you still, do you have a kit? Do you play? Well, I'm weirdly, so in like, I think five days time or something, like six days time, I'm going home to Kettering. I'm getting my old drum kit, which I haven't played in. It's been in its drum cases for 12 years, just gathering dust and nothing's happened to it. I'm going to load it in the car, uh, go back to London, unpack it in the studio, not tune it. And after having not practiced drums in 12 years, I'm going to record drums all day for two days. <laughs> And with an out-of-tune drum kit, with absolutely the rustiest I've ever been. Is this for a particular reason? Yes. <laughs> Is uh, it a uh, reason it, you can tell me about? Yeah, I think so. It's, it, it's a project I wanted to... I just kind of... I played drums like... So I actually myself released an album in 2016. Well, Whoa, I, so, hang so, on. So, so, so it, it, it's the only bit of drumming that I have done since being in bands. But... um where there's a load of bands that I used to know from school and I was a fan of theirs and bought their demos that would, they, they would sell at gigs and they've each got at least one song that I thought that I still think today is an amazing song and I was like oh no one will ever hear these songs all these bands are broken up now so in 2016 I got everyone kind of back together almost into the studio I played drums like, but I only got things like I got each song right once you know <laughs> like everything else was so rusty I couldn't even play standard drum beats anymore <laughs> But we recorded them all again as like indie grunge songs and released this album. So that's the last bit of drumming I've done. What, what's that album called? It's called Luna Dot Raids the Bee... Li- sorry. It's called Luna Dot Raids the Bee Pigeon. And it's because it's made up of all the different band names. Right, okay. So that, I couldn't be bothered to come up with a new band name. So I took one word from each of the old bands and put them together Got as you. best I could to make a sentence. And can I hear this? Can people listen to this? It's, hear on, this band camp. it's on band camp. It's okay. on band camp and all the money goes to the youth centres where we used to practice as teenagers. Great. So we're getting no money from it. There's, if you, it, it's, a, it's a pay what you want album. But any money that you do donate to it goes to these youth centres. Has it got the, the, the shredding guitarist? It hasn't because it's songs that were written by bands I wasn't in so right. bands that I was a fan of right of locally. course of course yeah, so sorry, like yeah. uh, and, and he's not on it I don't, I've lost contact with him and he didn't play on it and it would have been inappropriate to suddenly have a shredding guitar <laughs> solo on any of these songs um, the guitar was mainly done by a comedian friend of mine called Rob Deering who is uh, a genius guitarist and I knew I could play him any song and he could figure out how to do it in a grunge style right <laughs> And I enjoyed that so much. I, enjoy, I really loved making that album it, it, to a point where I didn't think... I was, I, was, I was surprised at how much. I thought I was doing it to get it out of my system. I'm the kind of person who, once I've got an idea to do something, if I don't do it, it's going to really bug me. So I was just mm. doing it to get it out of my system and do it. And I really loved being in the studio with my friends and recording music and it being a fun thing that... Uh, you know, had no basis in my career. There wasn't any kind of like, you know, path to be taken up, any goal with it. It was just doing it for the love of it and doing it with my friends. And so I wanted to do something else like that, but I was like, well, I don't know, you know, anything else that I do musically, I'd have to start from uh, square one. You know, I'd have to start like writing original songs and I'm not good enough to do that. I haven't played drums in ages. My drumming is going to be absolutely shit. I can't, do that and so i thought well i'll make that the basis of the album then and i'll i'll make the fact that i'm completely out of practice and completely i've neglected my i used to you know teach the drums i was properly i played for hours a day and i taught kids the drums as a job you know so like i'm and now in comparison i'm awful you know and i've neglected this talent completely and i want to do an album that's essentially about that so that uh, contrasts what happens when you completely neglect something and when, to when you nurture it. So I'm doing, uh, you know, two days of awful... Imp- oh, well, of my best. I'm going to try my best. I'm going to try and do it for a joke sounding shit. But I'm going to deliberately do it on an out-of-tune drum kit, try to play the best that I possibly can. Just drums. Just drums. <laughs> Cut that into tracks. And then the next week, we're getting a professional drummer in who is one of my heroes, who's going to come in and he's going to tune the drum kit, same drum kit, and then play over the stuff that I've played and do 
either accompaniment to what I've done or better versions of what I've done, like proper versions of it. And then we're going to mix it in a way that uh, that kind of uh, showcases both of them and contrasts okay. them both. And then there's some other musicians I've got lined up who are going to do stuff over the top of that afterwards. But the immediate stuff that's happening next week is the dr- me and this other drummer. Is the Okay. Are you allowed to say who the other drummer is? Or is that? Seb Rockford. Who is from Polar Bear? Oh yeah, and uh, all those. He's a jazz drummer. He's a proper, tr- yeah, one of my heroes. Can you play jazz drums? Would that be I the sort of thing that you would play? Used to be able to play a, li- a bit jazz yeah. drums, and uh, but he's a very versatile drummer. He's been in loads of bands that have fused jazz with all manner of genres. He, uh, I actually met him through doing this BBC podcast. We did an episode about the John Bapp album, where now when the drum drumming on that is in- incredible. And the whole album started off with drums and then everything was built around it. So I wanted to get drummers in to talk about it. I've got Adam Betts, who's an amazing drummer uh, with Square Pusher and, and, mm-hmm. and acts like that to come in and a solo artist in his own right. It's an entirely uh, uh, drum solo album that came out in 2016, which is uh, incredible, uh, called Colossal Squid. And um, Seb Rockford uh, came in and did that episode as well. And there was like two drum kits set up with those two. And I was talking to them about the drumming on this album and how much we love it. It's a, it's like a bonus episode for the podcast. It's like a longer deep dive into... We've got these bonus episodes that are yeah longer and investigate albums a lot more. And I met him through that. You know, He did the episode of the podcast and um, just played loads of different styles of drumming on it. I tried to show him one of my drum beats that I used to... The production team forced me to show him a thing I had done. And to my surprise, he really liked it and sent me a very nice email about about it because he said oh, I've been thinking about that drum beat you did a lot and I just then confessed to him in the moment I wrote that drum beat when I was in a band and obsessed with his drumming and I was it's the beat is me copying him <laughs> that's, and what, that's, that's why, why he likes it, it. I was yeah. like, that's probably why you like it because it's me just trying to sound like you when I was 17 um, and then you know I just seized the I already had the idea for this uh, this album in my head and I thought I'll just I'll ask him if he wants to do it and uh, I was astounded that he, you know, he, he would have been my first choice anyway i never thought i would have got him and uh yeah i can't believe he's gonna do it but, wow um you know it's just a bit of fun for me mm. but that's why i'm talking about it so enthusiastically <laughs> it's so much fun so the new podcast is mm. you're going to go through 50 of your 600 records yeah with different different comedians going to join you yes you're playing you're gonna you're gonna have 25 guests right and they're all gonna listen to two each yeah right. so i've got fi- there's 50 episodes 25 guests two episodes each and each episode i've sent them an album in advance which is one of, one of my favorite albums not just from 2016 but from all time and they are going to come on the podcast and they're going to tell me what they think of it and i'm going to tell them what i think of it and why i love it and by the end of each episode, I'm going to see if they will admit that 2016 is the greatest year for music of all time. And uh, so, you know, that gives the, you know, the listener, if it's an obscure album you've never heard before, you don't need to worry about not knowing what we're on about because the other person I've got on as a guest, they've only just heard they've it for the first it. time. Right, yeah. So we're, we're, it's, it's someone who loves something talking to someone who is a novice to it and who's, who's new to it. Sure. And do you, uh, most of them, most of the 50... I know you've got. I know you've got some big ones like yeah. Lemonade's going to be in there, yeah. and Blonde's going to be in Blonde's there. Blonde's going to be in Black Star. Run the jewels free. Some some of the Thank big you. stuff. Yep. is going to be in there, but there's also some really obscure stuff. I yes. presume. What is, is there in there that the album that you like that is from a Ned Flanders tribute <laughs> band? <laughs> that is not in there. Can so, you just explain what that record that is? Because album, I yeah. I read about that being because it's in the book isn't yes it? and i listened to them today i listened to a song by them called um white wine spritzer yep they are to describe them they're like a metalcore band yes called what are they called they're called oakley doakley oakley doakley the album is called howdily doodly and it and they dress as ned flanders from the simpsons yep and all, all of the songs are, are based on him on Flanders, so they're singing in Ned Flanders quotes and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, every but it's song quite is named well after like um, it. it's well done, isn't it? Like, yeah, it's not um, like they are can clearly all play. 
Yeah, the reason why it's like an album that I mention in the book and that I've talked about a lot is because it was definitely the tipping point where I realised, okay, this I don't have any control over this project anymore. <laughs> like, I don't have any control over what I buy because I have to own this album because I can't... It's like I was saying earlier about that album we talked about. I can't say... I know everything about, oh, I, I'm like, I know more about the music of 2016 than anyone else. And yet I didn't buy the Ned Flanders metal album. <laughs> like you kind of have to own it. Yeah. So like I, there was albums like that where it's like, well, just without even listening to it, I have to own this album. Yeah. And um, it's a really interesting experience, that album, because sometimes it comes on my, on shuffle. Yeah. And I'm like, this is good. Well, who's this? And then I go over and I go, oh, no. <laughs> It's oakily dokily. I'm enjoying them at face value. Uh, like it, it's a weird one because it's like it, the kind of the, the very concept of it stops you from engaging with it on just a normal level. Yeah, yeah. But it is actually. But they can play because yeah. have you heard that band Harry and the Potters? Do no, you know Harry and the Potters. Oh, I can guess where this is going, yeah. but no, I've not heard them. <laughs> they, I mean, they've been around a long time since since maybe the first film came out. Yeah. So, what twenty years maybe? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's and um. It's two guys. I think they're from Boston. Uh-huh. And they dress as Harry Potter and all of the songs are yeah, about yeah. Harry Potter. But they are really DIY, really stripped down. Mm-hmm. Um, like, sound like Beat Happening or something. Right. But it kind of makes... They, they, they're not brilliant. <laughs> like, it's brilliant in its, for, for what yeah. it is. But mm-hmm. not like Oakley Doakley, who, as you say, it comes on shuffle. Yeah. And you're like... This is a good band. Yeah, yeah, this but, is actually a good band. Good. I, mean, they, I mean, they've changed members so many times, and all of them have nicknames like, you know, Head Ned, Dread Ned, and all, and they've, every time they change a member, they have to think of a different word that's like one syllable and rhymes with with Ned. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's it's mad how like it comes up, and like I, I think it will never be one of my favorites just because I can't get past the Flanders thing. Yeah, but. Uh, but I'm delighted that it came out that year and that it was something... Cause, you know, ultimately, when you're talking to people about the albums that came out in one year, um, without playing... You know, there's some albums that are like really great indie albums mm. that had to grow on me for a bit and now I've got some of my favourites and I love them. But it's hard to like sell that to people yeah. and go, oh, there's this band and there's just really good guitar songs. <laughs> but so like, But it's much easier to go, okay, there's this one album... And throughout the whole album is the sound of an active beehive for the whole thing. And it's this constant droning noise of all the bees. And over the top of it, a cellist has figured out that the bees are are humming in the key of C. So they're playing in the key of C, the cello over the top of it. And then there's, like, by the way, I'm I'm talking about the album B by one (laughs) right now, which was originally an art installation. uh, And it's the guys from Spiritualized did it. And like, it's, there's more to talk about yeah when you, when you go on about those albums they're not necessarily your favourite ones but they're really interesting albums that are worth listening to uh, and again emphasises the fact that you know we can casting aside the kind of just fun little convincing people 2016 is the greatest year for music of all time which is just a bit of a laugh really like trying to convince people of that it's a fun little game but really the whole point is there is so much great music being made today and so much interest in music and inventive music. And you go, for example, people are doing this stuff. People are, you know, harmonizing with bees. Yeah. You know, there's like a lot (laughs) of stuff going on. Uh, People are still pushing things and being weird. Uh, It's not just all throwaway disposable stuff. Yeah, sure. Because, I mean, you can't really listen, you can't really buy 600 albums at any point and for them to all be of the same thing. It's really eclectic, your mix. Yes from Bees to, yes. Ned, to Ned Flanders. Yeah, cover yeah. Band. all the way from Bees to <laughs> Ned Flanders. <laughs> Covering all the bases. Is there anything, just musically, generally, not necessarily in this project, that you just won't touch? A strand of folk music or I don't certain... think I could say that because it all depends on how it's done. Mm. And what I've, really what I've been identifying more through this project is what I don't like within certain genres that turns me off. So like... Uh, I'm more able to listen to songs now and say why I don't like them and what could be changed that would mean I would love it. You know, so it's like, for the most part, I don't like just big, chuggy rock music that is like very straightforward rock music and it, it I, I find it boring. Mm. But a lot of the time it's, it's not because of the music itself, it's because the production is always pretty predictable and mm. uh, just straightforward and inspired production and the vocalists are often... 
you know, just sound, you can't pick them out of a lineup, just classic vocalists. And whereas actually, if the production was a bit more interesting and the vocalist was a bit more, uh, you, you know, unique, then um, I'd probably love it, you know. So it's not the genre, it's the way that people do them. And um, for so much of it as well, it's just the, the production. Like so much, I, I, I didn't care about production before this. And now I realise that actually... There are certain styles of music, like rock music or folk music, where the more clean and glossy the production is, the more I don't like it. Yeah. And actually, I really like to just hear, I, I hear people properly creating and performing something. And uh, although you know, I like loads of electron electronic music as well, uh, samples and stuff. But you can still, it comes through. Yeah. You know, even if you can't hear someone playing something live, it comes through how much they genuinely are exploring a genre and care about it. Mm. You should listen to Harry and the Potters. I think they're the band for you. I think they're my favourite band. <laughs> yeah, as of now, they've got loads of albums as well. <laughs> I bet they have. I mean, they've they <laughs> More have so than the Harry Potter book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've been drinking a lot during this podcast because uh, I've got a bad throat, so I've got to keep it lubricated. So I've gone through a glass of like what I think was carrot juice and. A cup of lemon tea. I'm now dying for a piss and also uh, pretty concerned. I've been gulping into the mic the whole thing, so enjoy. Anyway, good night. <laughs>